There was a land of cavaliers and cotton fields called the Old South. Here in this pretty world, gallantry took its last bow. Here was the last ever to be seen of knights and their ladies fair, of master and of slave. Look for it only in books, for it is no more than a dream remembered, a civilization gone with the wind. So that, Tom Holland, is the opening text of the single most successful motion picture ever made. Gone with the Wind, released in December 1939, uh, premiered in Atlanta, Georgia, and went on to sell so many admissions tickets that I think one in every two people in the United States and Canada saw it, and pretty much one in every two people in Britain when it ran during the Blitz a year later. So are you a big Gone with the Wind fan, Tom? I've only seen it once. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be honest. Um, and that was a long time ago. And all I really remember is Scarlett O'Hara going, fiddle dee <laughs> That's pretty much the limit. You didn't model yourself on Rhett Butler? I see you uh, as no, Rhett Butler. Fan. No, I was kind of much more an Ashley, kind of faintly, faintly Simpering, wet. Simpering, effeminate. Faintly wet, but, but sinister. Foppish. <laughs> Foppish, but sinister. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, th- I mean, I think it's, um, Gone with the Wind is obviously, um, I suppose, with Uncle Tom's Cabin. They're kind of two great literary bookends that surround yeah. the history of the civil war in America and its aftermath. Um, and we've done four episodes so far on, on the civil war. Uh, and in the last episode, we looked at um, how it's seen today. So all the kind of enormous contemporary resonances and ramifications that it has. Yeah. But essentially we left a big gap. So what happened <laughs> basically from when the civil war ended up to, up to the present day. And in a way, um, Gone with the Wind is the kind of the perfect way into looking at that question, I think. Uh, and Dominic, do you know, I'm not the only person who thinks that. No, you're not. There so someone else who thinks that. Uh, there is a suspended book, um, which is, has, has just come out, I think, by the time we, rec- we this is released. That's right, isn't it, Tom? That is right. And when we put, um, when, so when we advertised on Twitter asking for uh, questions, we, we got a reply from Count Gabriel Thursday. <laughs> Is this related to Sarah Churchwell's new book? Actually, he said Sarah Churchill's new book, but Sarah Churchwell's new book, The Wrath to Come. And do you know, Dominic, it yeah. is. It is. Because indeed. we've got Sarah with us. Hello, Sarah. Sarah, welcome. <laughs> Hello. Welcome to The Rest is History. So your new book, The Wrath to Come, Gone with the Wind and the Lies America Tells. I mean, the uh, the subtitle is, <laughs> is giving a few clues as to your perspective on this. I decided not to pull any punches. <laughs> um, so before we before we get into um, the lies that America tells, could we just talk about Gone with the Wind itself? Because I, I mentioned to Katie, my daughter, who will actually be coming on our next episode to talk about Love Island, which is a very, very different, very different field of study. Uh, and I asked her, had she heard of Gone with the Wind? And, and she hadn't really. Very, very, it, it meant very, very little to her. She'd never seen the film, certainly never read the book. So for, for people who may not be familiar with it, could you just give us a sense of how colossal a publishing and then a, a cinematic phenomenon it, it, it was, is? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll say that that size of its impact is, is in a sense still registered by the fact that even though your daughter has never seen it or read it, she still has faintly heard of it. So we yeah. can flip it on its head yeah. and say it's still out there. People are aware of it, even if only, you know, indirectly and ambiently. But, and that is still the, the outward reverberations of a century of, as you say, colossal impact. So when it, the novel was published in 1936 and it became an instant word of mouth phenomenon. It didn't have a massive publicity campaign behind it in some of the ways that, you know, we're now accustomed to. It was a genuine popular hit. And um and it and it instantly became the book that everybody was reading and everybody and who's, was who's talking the author? About in the United States. So it was written by a woman called Margaret Mitchell. And you said Gone with the Wind is a, is a good way into the bridging the gap, but so is Margaret Mitchell because Margaret Mitchell was born in 1900 and she died in 1949. So her, her life you know, perfectly spans the first half of the 20th century and she helps us also cover some of these key milestones in American history that bridged the Civil War until now. She was born in Atlanta. Um, and the famous character of Scarlett O'Hara, if anybody has heard of Gone with the Wind, they've probably heard of Scarlett O'Hara, um, the novel's heroine. And um, Margaret Mitchell based Scarlett O'Hara on her own grandmother, who was born into a slaveholding plantation just outside of Atlanta and um, bitterly resented 
the loss of her power, her property, including her human property for the rest of her life and raised her granddaughter with these stories of the grandeur of the old South of life before the Yankees came and ruined everything for the white slaveholders. And Margaret Mitchell grew up on these legends and gone with the wind is in one sense, a kind of compendium of these legends. But it's also important to say that from Margaret Mitchell's point of view, she she thought she was doing something more realistic. And, and I'm sure we'll get into that at various points. Um, so so her, in her mind, she was telling more realistic account of the Civil War years in a popular novel. The novel became a massive bestseller in the United States, and then it exported very, very quickly. Um, and and it went um, you know across Europe as fascism was on the rise. And in in fact, not only um, was it was it loved by people who were starting to see incursions by um, you know um, Hitler and um, Mussolini, but it was also loved um, reportedly by and indeed documentedly by m many Nazis as well. Eventually the Nazis um, banned it. But so, I mean, it was popular everywhere is my point as it started to spread. And then, and then the, um, the rights to the novel were instantly acquired by the legendary producer, David Selznick, who understood publicity very, very well. And he began a campaign to find the perfect Scarlett O'Hara. It was called The Search for Scarlett. This became a massive publicity campaign that filled papers and film magazines and the equivalent of social media at the time. And everybody wanted to be Scarlett. And so the idea was, you know, that, that you know, millions could try out across the country and he, maybe he would find an unknown and um, so, you know, you could be an amateur actress and still try to be Scarlett O'Hara. And he told all of these publicity stories about um, how he was going to cast the story and who would be the perfect stars of this, you know, incredibly popular novel. So that by the time the film was released at the end of 1939, it was backed by this three-year relentless publicity campaign. And it became an absolutely smash hit phenomenon. They said it was the greatest motion picture ever made, the greatest Hollywood movie. And it should be said, 1939 remains the classic year of Hollywood cinema, a year of greats like um, the Wizard of Oz and, and many other classic movies, but Gone with the Wind beat them all. And it was the movie that everybody wanted to see. And again, it exported very quickly um, uh, through Europe, through war, through war torn Europe. And as Dominic mentioned at the top, was incredibly popular during the Blitz, for example. People were queuing up in Leicester Square as, as bombs burned, you know, from the overnight bombings, or fires burned, I mean. So, so one, of the, one of the iconic scenes in, um, in the film is when Atlanta gets burnt by General Sherman, who's yeah, who's we talked about that troops. in the Civil War narrative, didn't we? Uh, Sherman's march to the sea and the scorched earth policy. And I, I learned from your book that Margaret Mitchell's grandmother had lived through the the burning of Atlanta. So presumably, that is something that is on the minds of people in the Blitz. They're kind of they're going in and they're seeing uh, Atlanta burn, and then they're coming out and they're seeing you know, London, the London skyline lit up with fire. And one of the, the kind of the, the great theme in Gone with the Wind is, I mean, Scarlett O'Hara is a, is a, I mean, she's a piece of work in a way, isn't she? I mean, she's, she's not what a you conventional would call heroine. Tom. She's a what baggage. you would call a baggage. Yeah. <laughs> she is baggage. indeed a baggage. She's very 18th century baggage. <laughs> but, but, but she, her, she, her, her kind of great life's mission is to get back her, her family plantation, which is called Tara, which was this kind of, it's, it's, it's where this, the land of Cavaliers and cotton fields and all that kind of stuff with which it opens. And then it gets destroyed in the, um, in, in, in the civil war. And, and her life's mission is to get it back and get her life back on an even keel. So presumably this is the message that people during war torn Europe are picking up on. Yeah. It's, it's this idea that things will get back to normal. Yes. I just have to dig deep and I will be able to get it back. It's a story about resilience and it's a story about survivalism, fundamentally on its most emotional level. And that's what people respond to. And it's worth, before we skip to war-torn Europe, remembering that it hits America in the middle of the Great Depression. So Americans who ha who are struggling, you know, people on, on drought-stricken farms who are struggling themselves with famine, Scarlett has to overcome hunger. She has to, over yeah, and she overcomes the blight of her farm. And so first you have the blight of the Great Depression, and then you have the blight of the Second World War. And in both of these two historical cataclysms, this story about human endurance and survival and, and sheer defiance, determination. Scarlet is determined no matter what. And as you said, what, so what makes her baggage is that she's totally unscrupulous in um, it, and she will literally do anything. So, um, you know, at one point she considers becoming Rhett Butler's mistress. If that's what it's going to take, that's what she'll, that's what she'll do. She, she will sell herself in marriage. She does sell herself in marriage. Um, she's perfectly happy, not happy, but she's prepared 
to do whatever it takes. And that's what people have always responded to with Scarlett O'Hara. And the other thing I think that's important to say at the top in terms of its popularity, Scarlett O'Hara, and I, and, I, and I talk about this at some length in the book, is really the first American every woman, the first popular character who everybody identifies with, but who's female. And that's for women, that's incredibly important. And right. so for a lot of women, she became this very interesting feminist figure because she's powerful. And as we said, she's defiant, but she's also deeply problematic. Um, and, you know, and she's a horrible person in a lot of ways. <laughs> and, and, but, that, but that makes her human. And that, again, makes her relatable. And, and so she She's an important landmark in popular culture for women as well. So we, we had a comment from Sarah Jones who says, I, I think it's an important film because it's a rare film from the female gaze. It's a war film with not a single battle scene. It's a woman's experience of war. And that's actually pretty rare. So, yeah, I mean, you know, it's so, true. And, and again, yeah. this was a way that, the, the, again, the story was received, first the novel and then the film, very strongly in the, the, among the first readers its early reception was that it was an anti-war novel. And that was really important in that what you see is the cost of war for civ civilians. It's that you don't see, it's a civil war novel with no battles. You don't see yeah. any battles. Nobody goes mm. to you the battlefield. You see the casualties. You see the casualties. It's, it's kind of famous shot, isn't families. there, which is actually on the, on the cover of your book. Yeah. Where is it, Scarlett has gone to try and get someone to help with, with a, a, a pregnancy, with a, a birth. With a, with a labor. Term, yeah, exactly. With a labor. And, the camera pulls back and you see this kind of vast field full of, of carnage. Inj injured so she soldiers. goes to the train depot to try to find the doctor and the doctor is tending the war wounded and dying. And, and Scarlett is being very selfish and saying that she has to help her friend, Melanie, her sister-in-law, um, give birth. And the doctor is like, what are you talking about? I've got thousands of dying soldiers. You're going to have to handle the pregnancy on your own. And then as you say, the camera pans back to these scores and scores and scores of, of um, wounded and dying soldiers to give a sense of the scale of the carnage. And Sarah, just, just one last thing. You mentioned Rhett Butler, yeah. played by Clark Gable in the film probably the most famous line maybe in the whole of of Hollywood frankly my dear I don't give a damn with which which it ends it's um, still the most it's still on on you know things like the American Film Institute's list of most famous movie quotes that is still the most famous movie yeah. quote to this day frankly so, my dear I don't give a damn so just just before we move on from what gone with the wind and the plot and everything could you just tell us briefly about Scarlett O'Hara and men and what her <laughs> because that's also I mean the key part of the plot isn't it and there are two in particular there's the guy who she thinks she's in love with and then there's the guy who she discovers actually all along she was in love with. Yeah. So um, so Scarlett is a kind of heroine in, um, chasing the wrong hero for most of the story. So she thinks that she loves Ashley. Every reader of the novel and, and um, you know, the audience of the film can see instantly that Ashley is not the right man for her. And that Rhett Butler, who is her twin in kind of every way, they're complete kindred spirits. They're both rogues and renegades and they're scoundrels, but they're sort of lovable rogues and and they're they're made for each other. And, um, and Rhett knows that. He's older and wiser and very sexy. And so he He's the kind of masterful man, and Scarlet is beautiful, but she doesn't. But she doesn't have any emotional um, self knowledge, and um, and to say the least. And so the the story is, you know, um, it, it spans. Um, uh, I think it, I should know this, but it, it spans thirteen years. And and she um, and and as I say at one point in my book, you know, she literally learns nothing except that she loved the wrong man, and it takes her over a decade to figure that out. Um, so Ashley, as you said at the beginning, Tom is this kind of um, he's he's you called him wet. Um, he is uh, he's nostalgic. He represents the old South, and he represents this old way of life. And he's idealistic and and a bit naive, and um, and he reads books, and he's ineffective, and um, and so but he's handsome and so Scarlett kind of falls for him as a young girl and then never changes her mind until the very end. Rhett is this dashing, as I say, he's this rogue who comes in and he's he's the black sheep of his old, of his old aristocratic family. And he recognizes that Scarlett is a kindred spirit, but she's too pig-headed to see it. And so he spends most of the story um, trying to convince her that, you know, that he's right for her, but he won't He's too proud, of course, to let his real feelings show. Um, and one of the things that's so famous about Gone with the Wind as a story is that as a romance, it's a very rare thing in that um, it's not star-crossed, they don't die, um, but they don't reconcile either. Rhett walks out on her and that's when he says frankly my dear I don't give a damn it's the answer to her question if you leave me where shall I go what shall I do and he says I don't care don't yeah. <laughs> and walks out the door and that's the end of the story and so it's this very famous ending for a romance of the hero walks out yeah. and says up yours yeah. <laughs> so Sarah the the subtitle of your book is um the lies America tells and, and one way to maybe start 
getting towards that part of the story is to talk about the the, the film's premiere. So it premieres in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, there are 300,000 people, I think, on the streets for this huge procession. People dress up, don't they, in, in costume uh, from the Civil War era. It's a state holiday. It's a huge moment for the city of Atlanta, which is this kind of booming New South city, um, for Georgia, for the old Confederacy. And it seems like you could say a lovely moment of reconciliation between yeah. between North and South. But obviously... There are all kinds of shadows. A great example of the fact of that is the fact that one of the stars, Hattie McDaniel, um, is not welcome. No, at the premiere, none of the none of the black cast was welcome. At so Hattie, the so she's playing uh, Mammy, who is she's the, playing Mammy, kind of the, the maid at Tara. Yeah. So the so the housekeeper and Scarlet's nurse and um and the the most important black character in the film Hattie McDaniel would of course go on to become the first African American actor to win an Academy Award for her performance in Gone with the Wind, and exactly so people need to remember that when the movie came out segregation was still in force in Atlanta the black cast was not invited to the premiere um so you have pictures of this all white audience and when you know Dominic you say that they were dressing up in Civil War costume well. It was, it was cosplay, but it was cosplay as slave owners. So yeah. they weren't dressing up as slaves. They were no. dressing up as slave holders. And they were, you know, white women and dressing up as Southern bells in the big hoop skirts and, you know, men dressed up in, you know, 19th century clothing. But that was so that you could role play that you, the fantasy was that you still owned a plantation with, yeah. with hundreds of, of African American slaves. And so just beyond those happy photographs of white Hollywood stars and white audiences are black picket lines, um, African Americans picketing this because it was segregated, because they said this rightly. They said this is romanticizing slavery. This is romanticizing racial violence, and it is, um, and it's glorifying what is still, you know, still exists as um, racial inequality and segregation at the time. And so, what you have is um, a black cast who's and and a, and, a, and a white culture that's insisting, uh, and a story that says that slavery had wasn't bad for America. That's basically the the insistence here is that it's all over, it's all fine, we can move on, and we can just tell this happy story about what slavery was like. And and so black people are literally being told that slavery inflicted no costs on American culture at the same moment that black people are being excluded from attending a film in which they yeah. feature and in which some, as I say, some of these actors, um, you know, uh, were going to give award-winning performances. And when Hattie, and it's important to say, this wasn't just in the South. So when Hattie McDaniel um, won that award, she did so at a segregated um, ceremony, um, Oscar ceremony, from which she had originally been barred from attending that as well. And David Selznick, the producer, had to pull strings to get her invited to the Coconut Grove where the ceremony was held because it was segregated too. And that was in Los well, Angeles. So what, I, a really naive question. I, I thought segregation was happened in the South. No, it was across the United States. So it was it was known as the color bar and exactly. And people think it was only in the South. It was at its worst in the South, but it happened across the country. The fame, I always give the example of the famous Cotton Club in Harlem in the 1920s, which many people will have heard of, and people think of it as this mixed race speakeasy, it was whites only customers in Harlem in the 1920s. You had black entertainers and black serving people, um, you know, uh, staff, but um, but the customers were white only, and that was true across the United States. So the color bar, it it, it wasn't as rigid um, in the North, and it was and it was much more. Um, you know, location by location. And so you didn't necessarily have white water fountains and black water fountains the way that you did in the South, but you definitely had whites only restaurants, whites only, um, and, and, and across the Midwest, for example, whites only, you know, diners and, and things like that. So, um, it, it went on through the civil rights era. And that's why the civil rights wasn't just a phenomenon in the South. It was a phenomenon across the country for exactly that reason. So here's a question, Sarah. Uh, you can see why white Southerners, I, I, it, you know, you don't have to be a genius to work out why white Southerners like Gone with the Wind. Mm -hmm. It's, it's um, you know, a romantic, nostalgic uh, evocation of what they see as their their areas, their regions past. And we can go into... And their I'm, birthright. Uh, right. And I'm sure we'll go into dissecting all the issues with that. The question is why people in the North, um, you know, we've done four episodes on the Civil War. We've talked about the massive casualty rates, the horrendous treatments of prisoners, all of these things. Um, this is within living memory. 
you know, you can still be old enough to remember the Civil War in the late 1930s, I think, just, just about. So why is it that people in, I don't know, in, in Boston, in New York, in Chicago, wherever, are flocking to this film in a in, in, in apparently, um, you know, a sort of guilt-free, shame-free, non-critical way, lapping up the Southern Bells, loving Vivian Lee as Scarlett O'Hara, loving Clark Gable, or, or am I wrong? And are, are do people have issues with it? No, um, you're not wrong. And the the main people who had issues with it were, as I've already said, African Americans. They were very outspoken at the time um, in their resistance to the film. There were a handful of white critics in the North and the South who pointed out what absolute garbage it was historically, how inaccurate it was, but also that it was deeply problematic. But for the most part, white people were very happy to go watch it. And the answer to that, I can I can put it um, very briefly as an assertion, but people may or may not believe me, but part of what my book is about is making the case for what I'm now going to assert, um, which is that the reason they were okay with it was because the, con the country reunited after the Civil War around white supremacism. Because the key thing here to remember is that, the, first of all, it's not even true that the war was fought by the North to end slavery. They didn't begin the war, as I'm sure you've covered in your um, in, in your podcast, which have not yet gone out yet, which is why I don't know. I will, of course, be avidly listening. Um, but that, you know, they, they didn't, the North didn't um, enter the war to abolish slavery. It entered the war to hold the Union together. And the fight, the, 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 the conflict was of, over the question of slavery, absolutely. Um, but they, they didn't enter it to create abolition, to affect abolition. Yeah. Um, as I say in the book, that's why they were the Union Arby and not the abolitionists, right? So they, the fight originally was to hold the country together. And abolition became a necessary thing to do in order for that to happen. And certainly the fight was over the, the expansion of slavery and whether slavery should continue in the United States. That was absolutely the core um, of the battle. But the key is that you can think that slavery is wrong and be okay with racism. And that's the key, is that you can think that black people are inherently inferior and just think that slavery is a moral abomination. So you may think that black people have a right to not be enslaved, but not that they are your equal and not that they have a right to all of the same entitlements and prerogatives that you have. And that was the... Um, the, the preponderant feeling among a great many white people at the time in North and South. And so over several decades between, and we should you know give people the anchor dates again, right? So the Civil War ends in 1865, Gone with the Winds comes out in 1936. So in that 70-year period, as you say, maybe a few people were still alive. Most of them were dead. But what white people had inherited instead was a story in which, in order for the country to come back together again, it had to, it, well, it didn't have to, but it did decide to, to convince itself that slavery hadn't really been that bad anyway. And because America is, is, you know, a lovely place anyway. And so everybody came together believing that actually, was slavery such a big deal? No, I'm not sure it was. And so in that mindset, you can go watch Gone with the Wind and enjoy it. So, yeah. Sarah, in your in your book, you sum it up by saying slavery was abolished by the war, but white supremacy was not. Yeah, exactly. So what what mirror does Gone with the Wind hold up to, to that process? What happened in the South in the aftermath of the Civil War? And and then what does that the fact that it, Margaret Mitchell is holding this mirror up? What does that say about attitudes in, in the in the 30s? Yes. So, first of all, what, what, what is what 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 is Gone with the Wind? revealing that is accurate about <laughs> what happened in the aftermath that'll be a of, short answer Sarah, yeah, of, the, exactly, of the civil exactly. war <laughs> but but no, i mean no, no, you I, know, your I, book yeah. you're saying you know you, you I, you're using the book to show that there all these kind of attitudes that were there in the aftermath of the civil war are still prevalent in the 1930s absolutely. so yeah so i uh, know and i can answer this. so so the the answer i would say is that what it told that was um was truthful was it showed the mindset of white southerners and that's what we had to, we must still i believe understand so scarlet sees herself as the victim of the civil war and the key thing that, that I want to do to reframe this is to keep reminding my reader that this was a war that Scarlet Society started in order to defend an indefensible way of life, which was to maintain black slavery. Scarlet and her um, and her friends and family very much see themselves as the victims. It's, they are the ones who were victimized by this whole process. And Tom, you said at the beginning of our discussion that she wants to get her life back on an even keel. That's her point of view. 
Yeah. But my point of view is that she wants to reclaim her power. She lost all of her power and she wants it back. She wants to be rich again. She wants to have slaves again, and she can't have slaves legally. But what the story shows is, and and I'm and I kind of give lots of examples of this, is that Scarlett's fantasies of power are never just getting her money and her house back. It, they're always entangled with fantasies of having black people working the land again. And she says that in so many words over and over and over again. She says she would never feel like a lady again until black hands, not white, were picking cotton at Tara. So there is a race-based order that she is determined to restore. And the mindset that, that it captures is this moment when white people in America began to see themselves as the victims of racial equality, of the victims of any movement towards civil rights. And of course, black people do not have the power in the post-Civil War American South. And so one of the things that I'm doing in the book is kind of fact versus fiction is really the setup of it. So I show um, you know, what Mitchell claims and then go into documentary history to, to say what the record shows. And black people are very, you know, so, so in, in Scarlett's mind, black people are suddenly running running the South. Black people weren't running the South. So what they refer to, um, and they did refer to historically, as quote unquote Negro rule, so white people under the thumb of African Americans, what they referred to as Negro rule and saw as completely unacceptable was one black legislator or two black legislators. It was having any black people in a supposedly representative multiracial democracy at all. And they saw that as a completely unacceptable state of affairs. And that is the, the, the society that they are rejecting. And she's, she and her friends are determined to recreate the privileges of antebellum slave, uh, white, white slaveholding South in as many ways as they can. And that is indeed what the white South did in the aftermath of the Civil War. It, and you said, you know, you wanted to catch us up on the history. So I think we probably have to go into that is what happened then. The white South set about recreating as many of the structures of the racial hierarchies of slavery as they could, except without slavery. So the, the problem that is faced by the slave owners, the plantocracy, once yeah. they've lost power, once they've been defeated in the Civil War, from their point of view, is that people who were formerly their slaves have not only been freed, but been given the vote. Yeah, and power. Therefore, power in a representative democracy. And so if, if you want to kind of have to recreate a society that approximates as closely as possible to the society that existed before the Civil War, therefore, you have to intimidate, restructure fundamental political rights and so on, so that an entire section of that society is unable to access them. Well, that starts so quickly, though. I mean, the, the, so a, the clan, the most yeah. famous example of that, is founded in the, at the end of 1865. I mean, they don't even wait. For, yeah, but yeah, exactly. Yeah. One year. Yeah. So exactly. And so that's it. And this is really, really crucial for people to understand is that the, the clan... And, and this gets really complicated because there have been different iterations of the clan. But the original clan, and this is one of the things I, I show at great length in the book because I think it's so important and it's been lost to, um, to, to most people's understanding of the first clan. It was set up with the explicit intent to disenfranchise right. Black Americans. It was there to remove their ability to vote. That's what it was for and that's what they did. So Sarah, could we take a break now? But when we come back, could we follow this story through so the Ku Klux Klan Jim Crow all that kind of stuff how it how it was that a kind of simulacrum of slavery was reconstructed in the aftermath of the Civil War and take us through that story up to up to this up to uh, Gone with the Wind so thanks very much for listening we'll see you after the break Welcome back to The Rest is History. We're talking about Gone with the Wind, the lost cause of the Confederacy and memories of the American Civil War. Uh, so Sarah Churchwell, um, Gone with the Wind takes about 17 hours to um, explore what happens in the aftermath of the American Civil War and the defeat, effectively, of Reconstruction. Um, the defeat of the attempt to give people who had formerly been slaves full uh, political and particularly voting rights um, in the in what, what had been the Confederacy. So Gone with the Wind sort of goes into that, but it tells it from a very, very particular point of view. <laughs> so, I mean, my take on this would be that the attempt to reconstruct was always doomed to fail because the North was never prepared to put in enough troops to make it work. And we talked about this in our last Civil War episode. What's your take? Do you think this is a, this is 
something that could have worked or do you think it was doomed to fail? I think it, it, it probably was doomed to fail, but I love the, um, the audacity of it. And I'd like to give a little bit more credit to that because what we have as a country, I mean, what an experiment, right? To try to go from race-based slavery to full multiracial democracy in the space of a couple of years. Like there's a part of me as I'm quite proud of that as an American, you know, like, well, good on us. You know, I mean, you got to give them credit for trying. But for me, it was doomed to failure, not only because the North wouldn't make sufficient investment and you're absolutely right, that was crucial, um, but because the, you know, the problems of reunifying the country after the Civil War went beyond that. You can't just have an occupying force in your own country indefinitely. So what was that supposed to look like? And of course that doesn't look like peace, whatever else it looks like. If there is an occupying force from the North, it doesn't look like peace and you're trying to create peace and to and to reunify to genuinely reunify and what does that look like but for me the other reason why it was doomed to failure is that these are people who went to war to defend race-based slavery and then you tell them to become effectively 21st century multiracial you know um well, we would say democrats but i mean small d democrats yeah. um of course they weren't going to do that. I mean, it's, it's it's such an idealized idea that they would do that in the first place. But the thing to, to for us to bear in mind as we understand what happened to Black people in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War is that the franchise was not removed from them simply by hook or by crook, although the the, pl the plantocracy did everything that they could think of, the slaveocracy, um, any any way that they could. But, but murder was fine too, right? And so we need to remember that. They were killing black legislators in broad daylight just shooting them down when you say they do you, do you mean the ku klux klan i'm well no i mean white supremacists so they may or may not have been members of the klan the klan was just one of many white supremacist yeah. there groups. are lots of paramilitary but, groups aren't there so the Klan is just one of many white supremacist paramilitary groups that um, emerged at the time. It's just the most famous and the most mythologized, partly thanks to stories like Gone with the Wind. Because um, Ashley's a member of it, right? Ashley is the leader of yeah. the Atlantic, of the Georgia Klan. And that's really, really important. And in the novel, that's completely explicit. In the film, it's euphemized. But in the novel, it's totally explicit. Um, he and uh, Scarlett's second husband, Frank Kennedy, are members of the Klan. Rhett Butler is not a member of the Klan, but he sympathizes with its um, aims and desires he's just not he's not a group joiner you know Red's too much of a he shoots a, a a black person for being uppity. we don't know that We're he shoots woman. them but he but he Kills lynches them. a black yeah. he lynches a black man for being quote uppity to a lady so we know that he murdered a black man and he admits to it but we don't know how he killed him right he may have hanged him he may have shot him whatever he may have tortured him we don't know the story doesn't say um but there were many other paramilitary groups and it's important to understand this there was the knights of the white camellia there was the white league there were the red shirts there were many others and many of those groups were reinvented in the interwar years um in the years of american fascism which is part of a, another story of american history that has been suppressed and one that i that i do bring into the book because i think it's so important here in bridging um, these eras. And so the people who were murdering black legislators in broad daylight may or may not have been members of, of particular paramilitary groups. They didn't self-identify, but they could also have just been white supremacists who just walked up and shot them in cold blood in the name of the old South, in the name of restoring their own power. And then all of the white, um, you know, plantocracy, they all, um, you know, self, you know, protected each other. And so what is, what, I mean, what are the, what are the police doing? I mean, it sounds a really naive question, I suppose. Nothing. Is, are, there no frame, are there no frameworks of law and order? Oh, totally break down. The police are white supremacists too, right? So, But that goes right on right into the 60s, Tom. Yeah, I know. I know. But I just... But, it goes but, on now. <laughs> it goes on now. Um, so exactly. But so no, this is crucial, right? So what we would think of as law and order in the South totally breaks down. When the North moves in, I mean, I, putting my hands up, I, I know nothing about the spirit at all. So, when, so reconstruction is basically the attempt to, to, to bring in frameworks of law and order that would enable black people to, to exercise their civic rights. And the failure of reconstruction is that basically people in the North just wash their hands of it and, and give up because it's too complicated. But it's, it's not just that, Tom. I would say, Sarah may disagree, I would say a successful reconstruction would rely on the support of Southern elites. I mean, as any as any form of occupation does, as any Absolutely. empire or any military occupation, you need to co-opt the powerful people in that community or, or or a degree of support in that community to make it work so you don't have to do it, at the, at the, as it were, at the point of a bayonet. Yeah. And surely the issue in the South is exactly what Sarah says, that there are just far too, I mean, as people, given that they've already fought a war to defend yeah. this institution, they're not going to say within six months, oh, yeah, you're actually right. 
fine. Yeah. I, I forget what I've previously been. Be my believed. best friend. Yeah. You know, exactly. And so that's, and I absolutely, I, I completely agree with Dominic. And, and, and the problem is that the civil war keeps being fought at this point, but just through proxy battles, through skirmishes. There, there was an enormous amount of violence, some of it more organized than others. There were riots around most of the elections, the subsequent elections after the civil war. Um, there were massacres of black people at the time. I mean, they were massacred when they attempted to exercise the vote. So it isn't just a question of what could the North have been doing, but you've got to remember that the Police are local forces in the United States, and, and they they're elected, were also aren't they? they're kind of sheriffs. And so well, on. yeah, and it, it's all set up differently yeah. in different places. Yeah. There are different rules for it, but exactly. And so they were white supremacists too. I mean, I, I tell the story; it's a terrible story, but one of the stories I tell is um, in the book is of a of a black man who was um, taken out to be lynched. He was he was ultimately not killed, but he was tortured and um, maimed. Um, I don't know how um, strong stomach your listeners have, but you can edit this out if you don't want me to say. But he was castrated and he was stripped naked in the cold and then you know they sent him off into the woods and he walked two miles to find the nearest doctor and the doctor wasn't at home because the doctor had been one of the members of the clan who attacked him right this right. is the kind of entrenched violence and, and white supremacism that you're talking about you go to the courthouse and you'll find that the police are the guys who just attacked you in the woods yeah okay so and jim crow so yeah. what exactly, who, who exactly is Jim Crow? I've always wondered. I mean, I know, I know you tell us in the book, which is why one of the many things that I learned from the book, I'd always wondered that. So, But just, many of the listeners may not know who or what John, Jim Crow is. So, Yeah. So Jim Crow is a um, an African-American trickster figure like Br'er Rabbit. So he's a folklore figure um, that, uh, and, he, and he represents a kind of um, a fusion of um, West African folklore with the slave experience. And so these African-American um, legends and stories get um, developed. And, and one of the things that's wonderful about that history that, um, that many, many scholars have, have worked on um, over now many decades um, is that for the, the way that that entertainment worked was that white people saw it as, oh, look, the slaves are just entertaining themselves with these stories that they're telling. But the stories had deeply coded messages about black power and about freedom and about liberty and about how you outwit um, your captor. These are often stories about outwitting captors. And so slavery, the experience of being enslaved embeds itself into these stories. And these trickster figures are the ones who can get away from the, from the powerful. And they're the ones who can, um, who can evade um, the structures of power. So Jim Crow was a, a folklore figure. And um, in the 19th century in America, um, there was an enormously popular uh, kind of entertainment became known as minstrelsy. Um, British listeners may remember the black and white minstrel show from the 70s. Same thing, blackface entertainments, but it uh, it came from um, antebellum America. And uh, Jim Crow was give it, was the name that was given to those minstrel entertainments. It just came through, again, through kind of popular culture. It just became the usage and people started using it to describe them. There was one I, I go into this in the book. It's probably not important for our purposes now, but there was one particularly famous blackface white entertainer who adopted the um, the persona of Jim Crow and became very famous. And there was a, there was a popular song and a popular dance. And um, and then as the the structures of racial hierarchies were reimposed in the white South after the Civil War, they began, again, just kind of colloquially, people started using the phrase Jim Crow to describe these. And we've been talking a little bit loosely about Reconstruction, but again, it might be helpful to give people some dates, right? So that we've got a kind of um, some anchor points in the in the conversation. So the, the ways that we would normally talk about it is Reconstruction lasts from the end of the Civil War in 1865 to the Compromise of 1877. And what happened in 1877 was there was a contested election. Um, that should sound familiar to listeners today. Uh, 2020 was by no means the first contested election, nor, nor was 2000 for that matter. Um, 1876 was a, was a contested election. And the truth is, is that the, is that the Democrats, which were, oh, we should also pause and say this. So it's all, it's very complicated, but it's important for, um, and I'm sure you went through this in your Civil War episodes, but it's important for listeners to always understand that in 19th century America, the two parties have a reversed position around civil rights and racial equality. So the Southern Democrats were the party of the agrarian South, of the slavocracy, of white supremacism, and the Republicans were the party of Lincoln and the party of abolition and civil rights. And so what happens in the um, contested election of 1876 is that the... Um, 
the Southern Democrats probably won. The white supremacists probably won, but it was contested and the elections were dodgy and nobody trusted the outcomes of these local elections. And so what happened was Congress had to come up with a solution on the federal level. And they, they came up with what's known as the Compromise of 1877, where they the Southern Democrats agreed that they would let the Republican candidate become president, and that was Rutherford B. Hayes, but they did so in exchange for with the withdrawal of federal troops from the Deep South. And at that point, Reconstruction was over. There was no longer any federal attempt to enforce the Civil War amendments and particularly the um, well, the civil rights, they were the first civil rights amendments, um, giving black people the vote and um, and protecting them in various other ways. So the, so the white North withdraws at that point and basically leaves the white South to itself, to its own devices, do your own thing, go wild, and, and absolutely abandons black people, abandons African-Americans to the intransigent white supremacist deep South. And at that point, what we know is Jim Crow begins to really get built. Yeah. So they, although they started early, they started as fast as they could. At this point, it starts to get legalized and and um, and the structures are created that would become the um, the the society, the racially segregated society of the early decades of the 20th century that that we know. So that's complete by about 1900 or so. And that's obviously the period yeah. at which you get the building of all the confederate statues exactly. um, you get the sort of creation the, the the entrenching of the the lost cause myth which gone with the wind basically incarnates doesn't it? exactly and you get one key um decision that that many of your listeners will know comes in this period which is the 1896 plessy v ferguson supreme court decision that says that separate can be equal and that's what legalized segregation and at that point racial segregation from 1896 is legal until it's reversed by the civil rights acts of 1965 so between 18 1996 and 1965, racial segregation is legal in the United States. And that's why to the earlier point about what, why wasn't it only in the South, because the Supreme Court legalized it in 1896. So Sarah, the lost cause myth, the, I mean, that's, I started this by reading that stuff about, you know, Cavaliers and, and all this sort of, this sort of called Walter Scott, Ivanhoe. Yeah, stuff. it is called Walter Scott. It's and, exactly and, right. And we talked about that a little bit in our Civil War episodes about that this this self image the South has has of being this sort of nostalgic, um, courtly, um, this place of old fashioned values, gallantry. I mean, they use the word gallantry, don't they, mm. in the in the text? Straight out of Walter Scott. So here's the here's a question. And so Tom McTague, who's one of our listeners who writes for the Atlantic, um, he asked about myths as cover for shame. Is mm -hmm. this myth? Is this a, a good example of a national myth that's a cover for shame? And my personal view is that I'm not completely convinced that's the right formula, because I don't know whether people in the white Southerners do feel ashamed about this. I mean, let's say in 1900 or 1930 or 1940, do they feel ashamed? Do they feel guilty about slavery and about the Civil War, or do they think? That was a great institution and that was a noble cause and it's a shame we lost, but you know, we just have to kind of crack on. What do you think? Do you think they feel guilty? No, I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, I think that they feel uh, they feel self justified and they feel and and what they did was they doubled down in their um, in their own personal psychological self justification and rationalization of of what they had done. But they did that to ward off shame. They did it to ward off guilt. So you know we could talk about how individuals may have felt about it. But what I what I would talk about rather than individual guilt or shame is a collective project of saving face and shame in that sense, very much so. So you've lost the war, you're disgraced. Um, you've, you've lost the, 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 you've lost the fight and you've lost the proposition that you fought to uphold. And so at that point, the cognitive investment in doubling down mm -hmm. becomes, if, if anything increased and you, and you have to go that much further to prove that everything that you did was right and everything you did was fabulous. But the shame is about military defeat. It's not about yes. that. There's no sense. No, they don't think they were wrong. Really. They don't think they were wrong. Exactly. No. No, no, no. They're white supremacists. They're intransigent white supremacists. So Margaret Mitchell, for example, if Margaret Mitchell was on this podcast, she would say that slavery wasn't wrong. Would she? Or what, what, how what would she say? By the 1930s, within 70 years, do they think slavery is wrong? Mm, they try really hard not to think about it. They recognize that maybe some slavery was bad, but, but they try to do it on a case-by-case -case basis. And they try to say, well, some slave owners were mean, I guess, um, but there were others who were lovely and there were slaves who were happy. And there were, you know, and so one of the 
key things that I try to say in the book um, is, you know, all of that works to gloss over the fact that enslavement itself is the ultimate mistreatment. <laughs> and, and, the, and the question of whether some enslavers were kinder than others is moot if you're enslaved to a great degree, right? So, I mean, one of the things that really struck me reading the book was the way in which the, um, the use of convicts and chain gangs basically reintroduces a form of slavery. And I, I, I assume that if you're a white supremacist, the justification for this is you're saying that black people are uh, inferior, therefore they are uh, likelier to be criminal, and therefore the safest thing for all concerned is to just lock them up in chains and, and make them work in cotton fields again. Uh, I, I mean, is that basically what's happening with that? Because it is, because it's, I mean, incredible statistics that there are chain gangs in which kind of the entire prison population, only four people are white or something. Yeah, I mean, amazing exactly. figures. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it is amazing. And a couple of things to, to remember here. It goes back to the franchise. So what they, so yes, you're right, Tom, in terms of the attitudes, like, well, they're better off in, in chain gangs anyway. They're better off. That's what they're saying about slavery, isn't it? They're better yeah. off being slaves. Yeah. They, they, they should be enslaved because they're savages, right? That's where the racism comes in. That's where the right. white, how the white supremacism works is that they, they, they can't, they're not fit to be let loose or their children, right? So you've got the benign paternalistic version, which is their children and they need white paternalistic care. Which is the one you get in Gone with the Wind and Mammy. Yeah, and, you, yeah, exactly. Or you get that they're savages who can't be trusted and they have, and they deserve to be enslaved. Um, and they need to be, you know, kept from civilized people, right? So, um, so, but the, the, if the franchise is really important here, right? So what happened was um, the Fourteenth Amendment says is, is a civil rights amendment that says that you that um, that people cannot be discriminated against on the basis of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. They stipulate those three things, but they don't stipulate thousands of other reasons why you could, in fact, discriminate against people and and why you could therefore remove the franchise from them. And so one of the first things that they did was pass. Um, uh, felon disenfranchisement laws. So they said, if you're a felon, you can't vote. And of course, many of those laws still exist and are still very controversial across the Deep South in particular, um, but not only, again, not only in the Deep South. And then what you do, you create pretexts to lock Black people up so that you can make them felons. So they're either back in chains where you like them, or if they get released, then they can't vote anyway, and you've effectively disempowered them. Right. And the other key thing to remember about the chain gangs is not just that the black prison population was so overwhelmingly black then as it is again to this day. Um, and again, those are connections that, that I draw in the book because I think they're incredibly important. But that many of the of the federal prisons that were built at this time in the Deep South were built physically on old slave plantations. So they were literally putting black people back in the same on the same mm. farms to pick the same cotton for the same people, only now it's a federal prison. And to this day, the um, state penitentiaries in Florida, in Mississippi, in Louisiana, are still known by their old slave plantation names locally. So Parchman is the Mississippi State Penitentiary because it was the old Parchman Plantation. And Angola in Louisiana, which is the federal penitentiary there, which is um, notorious because it's a death row um, uh, prison, um, it's, it's known locally just as the farm. You've been sent down to the farm, right? So they, and they, but because it's built on an old plantation. So they, so they didn't just replicate it in theory, they replicated it in practice. Let me ask you about the plantations, because obviously Gone with the Wind is not just a film about a woman, it's a film about a place. So that she's obsessed with getting back to Tara. She's obsessed with rebuilding it. Um, uh, I, to, I think Tom and I have both been to um, Southern Plantations um have we you've been to some plantation have yeah you i went to near? one outside uh Buford. yeah i went to one in um south carolina called boone hall very famous mm. for other purposes doing a different podcast a couple of years ago i downloaded their wedding brochure mm -hmm. and was and was thinking about what it would be like to get married on the site of this plantation where thousands of people lived and died as slaves so what's your take on the sort of do you think gone with i mean gone with the wind clearly enshrines the plantation as this place of kind of vanished beauty the civilization, you know, lost in the in the wind of time. Um, do you think that has that era has died, and that now most Americans have a very different view of plantations, or do you think that myth is too deeply entrenched ever to be sort of dislodged? 
Well, I think it can be dislodged, but I don't think it has been yet. And I think that what we see is this kind of extraordinary cognitive dissonance where people can hold these two completely contradictory ideas in their head at the same time and not think about them. And so they can say very easily, yeah, slavery was wrong, slavery was bad, and put themselves in hoop skirts and go get married at Boone Hall and imagine that that was all lovely, right? And and as you say, but for a certain type of imagination, we would be thinking about the historical realities of that place. And and to me, and I say this, and I know people don't always take kindly to these comparisons. I think they completely hold up in this case. To me, it's like getting married at Dachau. I mean, it is literally like romanticizing a concentration camp. Um, but the But the mythology allows for there to be these two separate versions where people talk about slavery as if it happened in a in a way that was distinct from this and one of the things that that i that I tried to think about a lot in writing this is kind of how does that work and how does that happen and 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 it seems to me that that one of the things that happens is that is that we use these cliched ideas, cliched language or cliched images that stop us from thinking about it. So you can talk about an ideal slave plantation, and that's a phrase that people use all the time, an ideal slave plantation. And again, to estrange people from that, I try to I put concentration camp there and go, what, what would happen if you talked about an ideal concentration camp? It's insane. It's morally deranged. And yet people will still talk about an ideal slave plantation and they'll be like, well, it was bad for African-Americans. Yeah, I, I grant that. Okay, maybe. You know, and it's like, no, you've got a complete, this is, this, this, this mythology was there to insist that it really wasn't that bad after all. So once you've gone down that road, what do you then do with Gone with the Wind? Because, you know, here you've got a film that embeds that idea that turns Scarlett O'Hara into a victim and her family are their victims. Um, it's hard to watch Gone with the Wind now, I would say, without wincing. I mean, you can be the most unwoke person imaginable and you will still watch that film and find bits that will make you wince and cringe and just think, oh my God. And it's a lot less racist than the novel. Um, could I just quote Martin Darlington? Mm. Martin Darlington on Twitter. I, I didn't like the pretty blatant nostalgia for a bike on age. Why is it still a regular in best film ever made lists? It's Confederate propaganda. It is Confederate propaganda. 100% right. Right. Completely. So, so, so... Um, Implicit in that question, you know, it is, it is still... It's a triumph of classic Hollywood filmmaking. It's a triumph of classic Hollywood filmmaking. I mean, you know, because Sarah said it's it, it's part of, of... Well, it's kind of bred of that yearning of fantasy, isn't it? That the, the, the Great Depression, you know, so Wizard of Odd and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's not as great a film as, as an arguably an even more racist film, Birth of a Nation, which is yeah. a, a colossal technical right. achievement. Y yes, so, so these the are... These are totemic films in the in the history of Hollywood and therefore of world cinema. Yeah. What, kind of what do you do with them? Well, that's the yeah. question, isn't it? Well, what that's do you the do? question, right? So and some people will say what we have to do is stop watching them and stop reading them and stop talking about them. And there are people who've made that case very forcefully and would disagree with my bringing it back into the conversation and saying this is something that 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 I think we need to to think about. I mean you know, it's a it's an ongoing question of how do we handle these problematic stories from our own histories and what do we do about them? Um, my view is I'd rather confront them, dismantle them, and think about what they're there for. And um, and and because if we just try to put them to one side, then what we've discovered is that people still just take what they want from them, unless you actually think that we should censor them, which I don't believe, and I don't think anybody, um, you know, in this conversation believes. So because the, I, I one of the examples that I use fairly early early on um, in the book is that there were some people present at the insurrection um, in 2021 saying that Gone with the Wind was their favorite book, right? So you've got people who are still going to read this story and encounter it. And if you do it without any kind of pushback, mm -hmm. um, again, unless you're going to try to destroy it, which good luck with that, right? That's not going to happen. Um, so given that it's out there and that people are encountering it, I think that the best thing that we can do is try to problematize it as much as we can and to and to make sure that, um, that people are educated about, about what it means and what it's saying. But also for me, it's to recognize that it captures all kinds of important truths about how we got where we are. And if, and if we deny it in the, in the sense of saying, well, you know, I want to I want to, I don't want to, th it's actually a very scarlet thing to do is I'll think about that tomorrow. I don't want to think about that right now. Um, it's, it's a troublesome thought. Um, well, it is a troublesome thought, but the problem is, is that it captures, it captures a historical reality 
um, the myth is itself a historical reality, right? The mythology happened and it, and it changed political reality in all kinds of ways in the United States. And that has consequences now, regardless of whether we know about it or understand it. And so for me, understanding this mythology helps things like the storming of the Capitol in 2021 make sense. And that's kind of one of the key arguments I make in the book is that, is that if you understand this stuff, then at least you can understand where we are and it starts to become intelligible. And so I do it on the basis of know your enemy, you know, I mean, we have to know what it is that we're combating in order to combat it, it seems to me. And this is a kind of, although Gone with the Wind is a reason, is, is an incredibly long book, it's still a reasonably um, discreet and self-contained entity for understanding a very, very complex history. So Sarah, would you say, I'm obviously Birth of a Nation would be another contender. Would you say this is a film? Has there been a film that, in your view, that has had such a bail? I mean, you clearly think it's had a really baleful effect on American culture, politics. I mean, is it the worst in your view? Because it was so successful and because it's so deeply enshrined the idea of the lost cause. Mm. Um, I should say, I was two things in answer to that. One is that, because I haven't said this yet and it's important. And, and since Tom said, you know, he, you barely saw it and barely remember it. I, sh I need to um, say for listeners that, you know, I grew up watching this movie and reading this book and I loved the movie. I mean, I loved it. So I'm very yeah. much an apostate here. And it's important to understand that because I also understand the feelings of those who love it. But I have come to believe that it had a baleful influence on my society. Absolutely. The baleful influence is because you love it. I mean, that's it's it's because it's it, it's it, because it's effective. It, yeah. yeah, it's effective and powerful, and yeah, Scott absolutely. Scott Harris is it's an amazing effective. character, and it's yeah. great. Yeah, and and so, but then it, it but then it it, it um, yeah, and it convinces you to think all kinds of things that, on second thought, I don't think I want to think, and that's part the process of what I'm trying to to. Um, take people through with the book. But so, but to answer Dom's question directly, no, I think Birth of a Nation was probably worse. And the reason I say that is because it directly inspired the rebirth of the Klan in 1915. And we know that we can, you, there's all kinds of ways in which that's documented. And so it led directly to the torture and murder of thousands of African Americans in the early decades of the 20th century. It's not clear to me that The Gone with the Wind has documented the same direct murderous outcome that Birth of a Nation had. But, and, you know, Birth of a Nation affected politics in a more, and I am going to use this word, unreconstructed kind of a way where Gone with the Wind was challenged from the moment that it came out, partly because of birth of a nation. So African Americans were pushing back against Gone with the Wind from the second that it emerged. So it was it never had such an unproblematic effect on the culture as birth of a nation was allowed to have for several decades when it enjoyed this kind of sway over white culture. So I think that was even worse, but that's a, a race to the bottom, as we might say, and right. it's certainly not to excuse Gone with the Wind. Well, Sarah, thanks so much. Um, that was a brilliant exposition. And um, I hope you have all enjoyed uh, what's five episodes now we've done on the on American this, Civil War? Yeah. Incredibly uh, complex and important. The question is whether this history. podcast will send people rushing to watch Gone with the Wind <laughs> and what Sarah would think about that. I guess you wouldn't be unhappy, would you, if people were watching Gone with the Wind off the back on the back of this podcast? I mean, I'll be honest with you and say I'd rather they were reading my book. Um, <laughs> and and or and let's. I mean, all, all facetiousness aside, I, I, if they are, I, I would I would hope that they would read my book too and and to understand well, the way that they're in dialogue. Okay, so Sarah's book, The Wrath to Come, Gone with the Wind, and the Lies America Tells. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, thank you all for listening. We will see you soon. Tomorrow's another day. Goodbye. Tomorrow is another day. <laughs> Bye. Bye.